They made him get topless with just an apron on and smothered him in baby oil and coal dust. Hello, and welcome to this episode of the Alien Familiar RPG Podcast. I am Clayton. I'm Beth. I'm Jordan. I'm Lenina. And before we get started, I just want to remind our listeners that you can find show notes and more at alienfamiliar.com. You can email us at alienfamiliarmedia at gmail.com. We are on Facebook at facebook.com slash alienfamiliar. And I personally am on Discord as DM Scorpio number 0660, and I've created a channel for Alien Familiar Media. Our topic for today is we are going to be talking about Echoes in Reality, the lasting effects of RPGs on the real lives of players. And not too long ago, I saw a meme online of how to put Dungeons and Dragons on your resume. And there were three <laughs> items on this list for D&D on your resume. Met with peers for twice monthly creative, cre- creativity and conflict resolution exercises. <laughs> Gained necessary experience for character and skill development. <laughs> Learned to quickly assess situations and collaborate to find best possible or best practice situations. Uh-huh. There you go. Yeah. Okay. See, I honestly feel like one of the things that really sucks about there being such a stigma against, like, it seems like a lot of people either have no idea what RPG tabletop RPGs are, or they have like you know some of the stigmas that we've discussed about them, and like, um, you know, I feel like you should be able to to put gaming experience on a resume, especially if you've GM'd, um, the same way that you can put, you know, that you volunteered for somewhere or you were a sports coach, you know, you're using a lot of like the same abilities of like organizing and planning and managing people. And teaching someone how to do something. Right. I feel like, like the only problem with that is you've got nobody to regulate it. So anybody could say that, but they could just be, you know, honking out a bunch of garbage for a couple of hours and just kind of winging it off left and right, not helping anybody or causing problems. Nobody mm. regulates resume claims. Yeah. I, nope. I, I meant it with like <laughs> <laughs> the events themselves, not resumes. Nobody checks to see if I, uh, if I had volunteered for Habitat for Humanity when I was in college, but it makes me a good person. <laughs> it makes me look like a good person to a, to an employer. When, if I put that on my resume. I personally did not volunteer for Habitat for Humanity. I actually did. Um, The thing we were talking about earlier is that, and I'm sure there are a lot of positions in Habitat for Humanity where you do like more important things and would, you could put down for like a leadership position. But I personally hauled, um, oh, what are they called? Cinder blocks. Cinder blocks. I personally hauled cinder blocks from A to B. Like that's what I did for like three hours a day for. I don't even remember, like a year or something, you know? Sounds so. right. <laughs> <laughs> so just because you feel, like I said, I'm sure there's plenty of stuff with Habitat for Humanity that is much more skilled than that, but, you know, that's all that I was doing. But I would, all I would have to do is just put down Habitat for Humanity, and that looks really good. But if you've, you know, GM'd a group and, like, come up, especially come up with your own ideas and, and, you know, led a group of people for a long period of time, you can't really put that down without the chance of running into somebody who would have a negative opinion of that. Yeah. And even as a player, I think like it, especially if you do it a lot over a long period of time, and especially in my case, in like formative years, like as a teenager, um, when you're just kind of getting your head around how you're going to deal with the world and, Mm -hmm. you know, what the best approaches are to problems. Like, it's so useful to have a bunch of different made-up scenarios that you run your mind through to find a solution and experience the consequences and, you know, bang into the walls of stuff and figure out, you know, where you're going to fuck up and where you're going to do shit right. That each scenario is particular. There are lots of lots of skills that can be spread out and generalized to, to many different aspects of your life. And I don't know. I think, uh, I think a lot of people would benefit from that. I mean, 
so many adults freak out when they're faced with some kind of situation that they've never had to deal with anything like that before. Right. But when you've kind of lived like a hundred micro lives over the course of years, like it's hard to come up with something that's really going to hit you out of the blue that you're just totally unprepared for. Yeah, that's true. I never thought about it that way. There's a quote that I like uh, that is that experience is something you don't get until after you needed it. Mm. And I like that. And fantasizing about taking action in whatever weird situation you've got actually causes the human brain to react better in stressful situations. This is what police officers are trained to do. They're trained to, when they're, when they have off time, to sit and fantasize about how they would handle whatever situation is possible that a police officer might be able to, might encounter. And so it helps train them on how to react in situations. And I don't see any difference between whenever we all get around a table and play these games. It really does teach people how to, how to negotiate mm -hmm. because yeah, you, you have, might have a player that's negotiating with an NPC character, but more often than not, you're, you're negotiating with other players. Mm -hmm. You've got, mm -hmm. you've all got different ideas about what you want to do how you're going to tackle a particular problem. And it is negotiation skills that come down to who's well in the best situation it is negotiation skills that come down to deciding how the plan gets implemented. Assuming you don't have some asshole player who's just, well, this is the way I think it's going to be. And so I'm going to do it this way. Fuck you all. <laughs> then you learn how to deal with people like that. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Cool. yeah. Yep. It also, it builds a lot of, like, cognitive thinking as well, because mm -hmm. you have to, like, think around it, because a lot of jams give you, like, heavy puzzles that you can't really get around until you try everything out, and it helps you build cognitive reasoning on top of that, and I think that's really cool. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's what I was thinking about, too, like, um, like, the whole idea of lateral thinking, which, you know, basically is, like, this term I hate, which is thinking outside the box. I'm sure pretty much everybody hates that term by this point. But, um, you know, I remember like, like I played, I played some D and D when I was a kid uh, and a lot of the stuff that we would do would be like, like my dad was really into these, what were called lateral thinking puzzles, like for kids. And one of the, like, for instance, one of the, um, really common ones, there's a billion different variations on it, but they'll say something like, you know, you're trapped in a room that has no doors and no windows and you have to get out. And there's like, like I said, there's a ton of variations, but like he would say, you have half a sandwich. You have a half a sandwich over here and a half a sandwich over there. And the, the, um, solution was that you had to say you put the two halves together to make a hole and you crawl through the hole, <laughs> 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 you know? And like that, I loved that kind of stuff. I still love it actually, but especially when I was a kid that like really grabbed me. Uh -huh. And, uh, I think that, you know, like ties in with what you're saying about like cognitive abilities, like being able to. Ugh, I keep wanting to say think outside the box, but I hate it so much. <laughs> but, um, yeah. You can use the word innovative. As innovative. Much as you like. That's one of those, you know, there five dollar resume words. And the other thing, you, you might consider this an off thing, so you might want to take it. I don't know. But any, but one of the things that made me think of is, um, and this, this actually comes from, um, a discussion in one of my psychology classes about people with schizophrenia. Like they talk about how they'll make these cognitive leaps between things. Like they'll go for, like, if you say the word lion, they might say the word stripes mm -hmm. because they went from lion to tiger to stripes really quickly in their heads and mm -hmm. they didn't put in that, that mm -hmm. middle thing. Mm -hmm. And so Clayton, like he likes to say, whenever I frequently say something that's like sort of related, but it took like five steps to get there from <laughs> the last thing he said, He'll be like, you're going line to stripes again. <laughs> but to me, that's kind of what, yeah, that's kind of what like lateral thinking is, is like either making leaps that you wouldn't have thought of necessarily logically, um, just going step by step like you normally would, or making leaps that like skip a step or two or five. Mm -hmm. <laughs> sometimes and, you need that. Yeah. yeah. And a lot of times that's where innovation happens is the person who thinks, who, who skips the step when they're thinking about what, what's possible. Cause then you've got to, you know what you got to figure out. And like, 
I, I'm having trouble thinking of an example, but like um, coming like coming up with a new technology. Steve Jobs wanted to make the iPhone. He wanted to make it for 20 years. He worked for 20 years in order to make that iPhone because the technology did not exist in the early 90s or late 80s, whenever he had this idea of how to make this thing. So he he had to uh, create all of the intermediate steps in order to make that iPhone. And a lot of times, like the the um, the creativity and the uh, the problem solving that goes on with that we do in role playing games, a lot of times has that where you have to think about what the end result of what you're going to be doing is, and then you have to formulate a plan that is doable for you to build upon until you can get to that end goal. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you can't just charge at the dark tower and kill the wizard in the first <laughs> session. You mm-hmm. gotta go get this item and go kill that little lieutenant dude and blah mm-hmm. blah blah. You gotta eat Figure it in out pieces. how to open the door and yeah. all that stuff. The same thing with character development too. If you're playing in a campaign that you've been in for a while and you're into the system, like very rarely are you the character that you want to be right at the beginning. You look at, you know, the high level feats and abilities and whatever, and then have to kind of like plot a path to get there. And, you know, you're sort of doing some some resource management and, you know, uh, long-term planning and, you know, who knows what's going to happen in the game on the way there that might Mm -hmm. affect that or what have you. But I think stuff like that is why I like crunchier games more than, um, more like freestyle narrative games because there's a a lot more resolution in your options and Mm -hmm. there's a lot more weight put on, you know, uh, putting things together in this, you know, logical thought out kind of way. Um, There's not as much wheel room to just like, I'm going to do this thing I saw in a movie once and okay, roll for it and see if it happens. You know, there's, um, there's more of a system to, to what you're doing. There's, consequences for screwing up. You can't just, if to use a D&D 3.x, you can't just whirlwind. You have to have the basis of power attack and cleave and all of the other stuff that allow you to eventually do that big thing. And you ha- and you do have to plot it out ahead of time because mm-hmm. you can't just, well, um, you can't just fly by the seat of your pants and hope that by the time you reach the level when you can take whirlwind that you have all the prerequisites for it. Mm-hmm. You know, I just thought if you play D and D or other role playing games a lot as a kid, I wonder if that prepares you more for like going to college and like having to like plot out because you're talking about prere- prerequisites, like things that you have to have to get to the next step. Like, I don't know. I've known I've known a lot of people. Um, I worked like with the university housing a couple of summers when I was in college, and there were a lot of people who were just completely confused by the class system and the idea of having you have to take this before you can take that before you can take that. Mm-hmm. I think that might be more of like a you haven't played any kind of cognitive building games as a child because mm-hmm. I was not introduced to D and D until college, but mm-hmm. I already had my four to five year step plan done by my sophomore year of high school. Mm-hmm. Um, but I know that. A couple other friends of mine did play D and D in their youth, but had no idea how to build pla- past like a year in advance. Oh yeah. So I think it's more of a um, cognitive games in general mm-hmm. because this person was also very bad at puzzles and like any type of puzzle. Mm. So it just depends on your strategical thinking and the way you can like look ahead and plan ahead. Yeah, and the ability to like consider. Oh, More than right now, right? I don't know but other than concrete, what's the opposite of concrete? Abstract. <laughs> abstract. The ability to uh, consider abstract, like like items and concepts, rather than having to have something concrete in front of you. Mm-hmm. I've I've often thought that like video games that have like skill trees and things like Skyrim or you know whatever um, things like that, that those sorts of models could be used to to gamify the uh the college course picking process mm. in, in a way that people would click with a lot better than just like 
here's your giant book of classes and, you know, right. go through all this shit that is always horribly indexed and all that. Um, that, would, that would be really cool if you could have like, all right, you want to go into psychology. Well, here's all your like top tier, you know, things you can go for. And then the classes that you need that yeah. like go up the tree. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's a really cool idea. And each step of the way, you know, a student would know like, okay, if I want to jump out of this path and start this thing over here mm-hmm. and change this, here's what that alternative track's going to yeah. look like. And, and then also it's easy to see how long it's going to take if they want to like mm-hmm. skip tracks. Yeah. It reminds me a lot of, um, like, what is it? Like, not, not, like skill building and like games like World, like World of Warcraft and other like tree building characteristic type of things where mm-hmm. they have the big things at the top, but you can only start at like level one down here, but you can see it all. But you, but can, you can see it all, it yeah, and go up. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that's kind of that does that makes it more concrete. Yeah. Another thing that I think would be good to talk about is it also builds social skills, mm-hmm. which I think is something. Like, especially younger kids that get into things like this, it builds their social skills a lot faster as they get older. I think that that's really interesting, especially because you get into arguments in games a lot Mm -hmm. of the time, and you learn how to get over that for the sake of the game, and you can do that for the sake of your friendships as well, or relationships with, like, authority figures or your GM, so Mm -hmm. to speak. I think that's, like, a decent parallel. And you also learn how to basically plead your case. You learn how to create an actual argument as to why you are right or why your way is best. Because it's not just whoever can shout the loudest. Right. Um, or just everybody saying, I just feel, I just deeply feel that this is the right way to go or whatever. Mm-hmm. That's what's cool about articulating a, a coherent, uh, well thought out strategy to something. And then you get to test it. It's mm-hmm. not just like yeah. we're debating and someone randomly decides who wins. Yeah. It's, well, you fucked up and the goblins killed you all. <laughs> Sorry, you were wrong. There's there's not a lot of uh, forgiveness if you really mess things up. Or a player has to save our asses and distract everybody else while everybody else gets away. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and the dice are reflect real life and that you cannot predict what's going to happen next. You can just make yeah. a best case scenario and try to account for when things go to shit. Right. And it gives you some practice with damage control, too. (laughs) (laughs) Got a budget for that random swerving in the universe. Yeah. (laughs) I mean, considering where we're at today, of course you do. (laughs) uh, I think another thing along the same lines is that it, it, for me at least, taught me a lot about detaching from my ego when dealing with stuff. Cause when you've got an artificial ego, that is this character that you're playing as, mm-hmm. um, and you're, you know, arguing as if you are that character, you're always still inside yourself. Yeah. You know, you're just projecting this thing. And so it's, it's not that big of a deal if you don't get your way or if you, you know, make a fool of yourself or whatever. And that's one of those things that stuck with me when I was growing up is that it's real easy to take that with you and then use it in your daily life that, you know, this personality that I am is as much a projection, though much more detailed and have much more time put into it as any character that I made in a game. Mm -hmm. And I can always kind of step back and remember, like, this is just some person that I'm playing through my life, Mm -hmm. just like it's a character I'm playing through a game. Mm -hmm. And it's a lot easier to to detach and not have all those like animal impulse, you know, emotions <laughs> right. to things that way. That would be and, really useful for anger management. Yeah. And not only to detach yourself from your situation, but also to see things from another person's perspective. Mm-hmm. Because whenever you play a character, it may be really similar to you, but you but you usually make it in some way not you. Mm -hmm. And that helps broaden a person's horizons. And anytime that people have been shown to think not just of themselves and like themselves, it increases the ability of the brain to think universally yeah, and to take into account other people's perspectives. And you do learn empathy that way. Mm -hmm. Um, You learn how to interact with people that way because now you know how somebody might feel if you say something that you initially didn't think was 
in any way offensive or threatening or anything like that. It trains you to be able to take a step back and think of it from that other person's perspective. And it also pulls you into a wider frame of concern than people are in by default where you're, you're normally just concerned about your individual goals. When you're in a group of people, um, playing a group of characters, I mean, lots of other things in life can, can teach you how to, you know, play as a team, you know, sports, obviously, um, the military has to drill it into people a lot of times, but uh, I'm told that from friends of mine who went to the military that it's pretty common for people to be playing D and D and other role playing games in barracks. Really? They've got all this time on their hands between yeah. missions and very little to do. And you know, it's, it requires very little, just some paper and mm -hmm. dice and stuff. And awesome. that the, uh, you know, commanding officers are really cool with it because it teaches shit like this. It teaches mm -hmm. tactical thinking. It teaches, you know, team thinking and I don't know. I think that's a, a very valuable skill that you can't help but pick up if you role play for very long. Mm -hmm. And also with that, and then tying back into what you were saying earlier, like it helps you learn how to compartmentalize, you know, which obviously would be extremely useful for somebody in the military and is useful for a lot of people just in regular life. It doesn't always happen. I have played with some people who kind of got, you know, if something happened in a game, there was a betrayal or something like they got mad at another, like the other actual person. But I think for the most part, like people generally do pretty well, especially like as they get older, yeah. keeping that separate. I think those people that get angry at things like that are in the process of learning that lesson. Yeah. Yeah. That once, once they get past it enough and realize this is so stupid. I was yeah. pissed off that somebody betrayed my third level bard. Right. Right. You know, it sounds so ridiculous to articulate it <laughs> that, you know, that, yeah, I think that'll stick with people when thinking about other betrayals and whatnot later mm -hmm. in life. Yeah. I've unfortunately seen people like terminate friendships because of D and D though. Wow. It, it, it was, it was pretty rough. I, Stepped back pretty quickly from that specific game, but it they 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 still don't talk today, and I think that's really bizarre that you let such like a uh, simple game because you wouldn't you might do that for a board game depending on the type of person, but it's mm -hmm. not as common unless you're playing diplomacy, yeah, yeah. <laughs> or or Monopoly. <laughs> People... And I mean, like I could oh sorry no good. I was just gonna say that I could see you know ending a friendship because a person was just as a person being an asshole during a game, but not because of something that happened in character, like between characters that like made sense in the game. I just don't think that they ever talked about it. I think that they went their separate ways and never really recycled back or cared enough to try to mend the friendship. And I yeah. think that was a big part of the problem. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think that somebody like that, if they don't learn the proper lesson from a situation like that, are going to find life to be unnecessarily difficult yeah. for them because the world doesn't care if you throw a fit about things not going your way. <laughs> 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 We've kind of just touched on just the, just hanging out and playing this game causes friendships to strengthen. Anytime you've got a group of people sitting together, doing the same activity as strengthens the bonds. And with this, we're all, we're all actively working together, similar to the way a military unit works together to, to accomplish their missions. Um, there is a lot of camaraderie that goes along with role-playing games. And personally, um, I am in the demographic of what is called the aging gamer. <laughs> <laughs> Christ, we're so old. Yeah. <laughs> when does that start? Aren't we all aging gamers? <laughs> well, I'm I'm beyond the uh, the target demographic. For like, we'll say like for like literally so, everything. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> When's it cut off? I'm starting to get worried. Now. <laughs> but I've noticed definitely since I've graduated from college, um, role playing games have been the way that I've met, like outside of work, it's been the way that I've met new people. Like Beth and I have, mo have moved a few times since we graduated from college. And that's been how I've established new circles of friends. 
after college, it's really hard to establish and maintain friendships. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's one reason why I continue to love gaming so much is it because it does give me that, that thing to do that, that allows me to, to have these important relationships that aren't just people I know from work. Not that I don't like the people at work, but I, I work with them. I don't always have the same interests as them. Um, I don't always have that, that personal connection between the people that I work with every day. You also don't always have the same freedom to be yourself with people at work. You right. know, there's your livelihood is on the line if you yeah. offend the wrong person there. And you can't really leave the workplace if, you know, you say the wrong thing and you now have like a strained relationship with a coworker. You just kind of have to learn how to deal with that. Mm -hmm. I'm like you, Clayton. When, when I moved up here, um, I didn't know anybody. I met a couple people at work, uh, but they were only, you know, they were decent people, but not people that, you know, I have a whole lot in common with. And it was hard to find a gaming group. I fucking worked at it. And um, I think that I made a decision at one point when I realized how how much harder it was going to be to make new friends after college that I didn't want to wind up like my parents, whose only friends in the world really are each other. And then they have some acquaintances at church, mm -hmm. but they don't ever go out and see anybody. They don't do anything. They just sit at home and that's their lives. And, you know, when I go visit them, like nothing has changed. They've got nothing else, no new input to process. And, you know, they'll, they'll die that way. And that is not the life I wanted to live. So I, I don't care if, uh, if I do turn into a, an aging gamer or a <laughs> geriatric gamer or whatever the fuck, I'm going to be a gamer until they put me in the ground. We're gonna. The three of us are gonna be geriatric gamers living near a college town, so we will. <laughs> <laughs> so we will constantly be hanging out with people in their lower twenties. Back in my day, we didn't have these newfangled holographic dice. You know what I like <laughs> about college students? <laughs> I keep getting older, and they stay the same age. <laughs> yes, they do. Yes, they do. <laughs> Nina, do you have any comments? <laughs> you look super uncomfortable now. <laughs> I, don't, I, don't, I don't really have anything to add in. Um, minus the fact that uh, there is a group of people that I have been friends with um, since I started college. Even though we, we still game. Like, we still... I'm running our next game, actually. We still play D&D. We still come up with our own games. Even though one of them's in the military in Conne Connecticut, the other one's going to graduate in Florida and the other one lives in like northern Ohio and then me and Kyle are here and we're all still really good friends we talk on a daily basis you know that connection that we had when we first started playing D&D together you know at an actual table has not changed it's just evolved to us all being online and using um like uh, D20 what is it uh, SRD S a website online Roll20 Roll20 that's it yeah to create the maps and you can roll dice on there. And I think that's pretty great because, you know, it takes a lot to stay with the same group of people and still want to keep coming back every week. Um, especially to make sure that everybody clicks and that nobody mm -hmm. has tension with the other. It's really not a common thing to find people that you get along well enough with to, want to see weekly for four plus hours at a time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, aging aside. <laughs> <laughs> I think uh, another thing I wanted to mention about um, role-playing games that has had an effect on, on me growing up. Um, I, uh, I had kind of a weird perspective about what it, what it's like to, to be a person and find your place in the world growing up because my parents were very religious and I, all I would ever hear about is like God's plan for things, you know, mm -hmm. like you'll find God's plan for you and then you'll really be on your way and whatever. And mm -hmm. like, that was the whole deal. And I always thought that was really strange, even from a young age, like you're telling me that there's like some plan that I have to find out about and then follow. And that's, 
that's my only option there. Mm -hmm. Like that was very weird for me to think about as a kid when I'm trying to figure out, you know, what do I want to be when I grow up and whatever the hell. Um, and I, I think that when I started gaming a lot and, you know, playing through a bunch of characters and, um, it, it's a completely different perception of life when you realize that you can do pretty much whatever you want and whatever you put your time into, that's what you're going to be good at. And there's, there's nothing that's, that's set about it that you can get pretty good at one thing to your satisfaction and then get into something else. Mm -hmm. And you don't have to be like locked into some like, you know, hyper specialized course or whatever. Um, you know, it's, it's the idea that you can be as good as you want to put effort into being that yeah. that's incredibly empowering. And I didn't really have that as a, a concept when I was a kid. Yeah. It was, it was like, realize the thing you're supposed to be instead right. of push yourself to whatever you want to be. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that, that completely flipped my worldview around about 14 or something. And uh, I think that's had an impact on me ever since. Um, yeah. That's funny because it almost de-incentivizes effort. Yeah. Like kind of in the same way that being told you're really smart from a young age does. Because mm -hmm. it kind of like makes you think, oh, I'm just doing well because that's just intrinsic to me. Mm -hmm. And that like that kind of teaches you that like effort has nothing to do with it too. Mm -hmm. Well, they do say that especially my specific generation because we were always told as you know kids to like follow your dreams right, do what yeah. you're really good at even though like dreams and being good at something does not come naturally uh yeah. compared to what they because they told me like you'll be good at something one day yeah you'll be you able to find the it 80s out. for that junk <laughs> <laughs> it's completely illogical <laughs> because it's ruined because i know so many people today they're like i still don't know what i'm doing with my life mm -hmm. Because they had no aspirations or dreams because they were just going to find something that they were good at. Right. And you can't be good at something without being bad at it first. <laughs> right. Mm -hmm. I, I took a great deal of issue with the idea that there is one particular thing that you're destined to be. Right. That, you know, as if, if you're not bolted down to this one pursuit and, you know, to the neglect of all other interests in life that that you're wasting your time and when when I got to thinking about it at a later age I, I started thinking this is a an incredibly like sort of capitalist mindset that mm -hmm. you're supposed to like figure out some job that you can be to like be worthwhile to society or yeah. something and that you know anything else that you care about is is nonsense but you know it, when the when the script flips and it's no, I'm going to live for myself and enjoy the life that I have rather than, you know, spend all my time studying law and put a pistol in my mouth at 40. You yeah. Know? Like, that's, I don't know. Yeah, because you do get a lot of that stuff about, like, you know, if you show any sort of, like, inherent talent in anything, it's like, oh, you have to, like, use this talent or else you're wasting it and you're you're an affront to God because yeah. you have wasted this talent that he gave you. Like that's that's what you're going to be then. Stuff you in a torpedo tube and shoot you off towards your destiny. <laughs> yeah. Jesus Christ. And that's why I feel like jack of all trades and people that can just learn and adapt are more common now. Is because there's so much that we can do on a daily basis. Right. Mm -hmm. So just do it. Like just take action and do it. And I feel like that's becoming more of a common thing. And that's why it feels like trades are kind of falling to the side because people want to do it themselves instead of paying somebody else to do it. <laughs> <laughs> you, you see the pop up in computer programming as a field a lot. Like old school guys who've been programming since. God, some of them the fucking seventies, but the the eighties, and they've got these old programming languages that they're they know inside now. They're obsolete now, and a lot of these dudes have focused so much on this one thing that their brain is no longer pliable, and mm -hmm. so to learn new technologies that are coming around are incredibly difficult for them. And the people that do really well are the people that have a good foundational understanding of the concepts. And then just look into particulars as need be. And, mm. you know, when you yeah. can Google anything, you don't need to fucking memorize all the details of right. a skill like that. So 
Yeah, that's a specialization. That's that's death. I want to give a concrete example of what you just said. Like another, like personal concrete example of what you just said. Like talking about languages and learn, like keeping your brain pliable. Like reading rule books is a skill. Like learning a game system yeah. is a skill yeah, to be true. able to learn and to be able to read and comprehend what you are reading and put it into action. Mm -hmm. Um, in college, I play a lot of role-playing games. Now in my current job, I am required to be able to read the Ohio administrative code and Medicaid rules and make some goddamn sense of them. (laughs) (laughs) And if, if, if you've ever tried to do this, you will learn that, um, laws are written to be incredibly precise in what the words mean. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times the meaning gets lost because of the precision. Mm -hmm. And this is a skill that I have picked up that, that I initially honed through learning role-playing games that I am now using in my job to be able to read and understand what in the hell I'm supposed to do with this arcane language <laughs> that very few people have the expertise to be able to decipher. Yeah. Yeah. It takes a lot of imagination to, to pick up after knowing a couple of one or two game systems and then pick up a totally different one and then look at the way that they're trying to completely reconceptualize and represent the world that, you know, you're going to be playing in. It feels neat. You can mm-hmm. kind of feel it in your brain, mm-hmm. like stuff clicking around in different ways. Like, okay, this is how we're going to do that here. And this is not really so emphasized and whatever. I, I enjoy it. Mm-hmm. I think learning to learn, that's, that's the thing. Mm-hmm. That's the most powerful fucking skill you can ever pick up. How to learn quickly. Mm-hmm. So, um, I've got a couple like little breakdowns of like, specific things that can be learned by people of different ages playing role-playing games. So like the youngest people playing role-playing games, I think that most games are um, on the box or on the, in in the book, they say they're like seven or age seven or eight or nine up. Mm -hmm. Um, So for those very early years, one, any type of reading is great for people that age. Yeah. um, For being, for expanding their ability to think, but also you get the benefits of just learning a whole new vocabulary, expanding your vocabulary and people like in their early teens, still vocabulary and reading, understanding rules. And, um, this is something that being able to, like you said, understand, learn new things, um, is a skill that sadly most people, atrophy after they've gotten out of whatever schooling they do, what if, when, after they've gotten to whatever job that they've got, they basically stop learning new mm-hmm. things, how to do things new ways. And role-playing games are a, definitely a great way, especially if you're the type of gamer who wants to try out the new thing, the new, the new game systems. Um, uh, that's something that I've actively tried to keep my mind able to do over the past few years as some, well, the, compared to the game systems that I learned in, um, in the early two thousands, like games like fate powered by, by the apocalypse. These are completely different, um, concepts of how to play a game than the old D and D or call of Cthulhu or, um, it, traveler or any of these old games that are just a bunch of rules and you just, you just implement the rules. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I remember reading the fate core book for the first time and I had to read it several times before I even understood what the, what the goal of the game was <laughs> or not really the goal, but how, the how process. the process of by which the game is played. Mm-hmm. I have also found out that I'm really good at arithmetic. I'm fast at it mm-hmm. because of years and years of practicing bonuses and penalties and, mm-hmm. you know, whatever kinds of modifiers. That's, that's something that my wife points out fairly frequently is that, you know, 
some random thing comes up and I can calculate it pretty quickly because I'm just thinking about it like it's game numbers. Mm-hmm. Um, but the, uh, what was I going to say? Shit, I had something that, fuck, I'm brain farting. I don't know, <laughs> coffee, I'm sorry. <laughs> Um, one thing I was thinking is that games can help um, kids a lot with the concept of jargon, like the fact that, Mm -hmm. which might have been kind of what you were saying earlier with things having very precise meanings, like learning that, you know, if you like learning a word in a given context, it might have a completely different meaning than it does if you're just using it every day. Mm -hmm. And that's helpful for all kinds of things, like every single job you can possibly have is going to have its own set of jargon. Mm Mm-hmm. I do think that the math is really important as well, because um, I remember when I was first starting to use calculators, they were always just like, we didn't have calculators back in my day. We were just (laughs) memorizing and giving out all of this left and right. Who needs a calculator? I can do this in my head. When I was in grade school, my teachers, every goddamn one of them said, (laughs) um, whenever we would ask why we can't use a calculator, because you're you're not going to become an adult and be able to carry around a calculator everywhere you go. Well, <laughs> for everyone's information and every teacher who, have, who has ever taught me, I have in my hands a smartphone. <laughs> and one of the basic functions that come on every smartphone is a calculator. Yeah. And I carry around everywhere I go. And I am an adult now. <laughs> Even Google can calculate now. Yes. Even if the smartphone hadn't come out, who was going to stop adults from walking around with a calculator? I know. They made like pocket <laughs> little ones, like, small tiny, tiny calculators. Could have but, calculator but people walk. didn't walk around with calculators <laughs> yeah. then. Yeah. But right. now people do walk around with calculators. Right. Something much more powerful than any calculator they could have mm-hmm. possibly imagined. I have a calculator. I walk around with it consistently. I still use my phone calculator more than I use my actual calculator. <laughs> One thing that I think was um, beneficial to me as a little kid, um, I'm talking like 10 or 12 years old when I first discovered my uncle's D&D books, um, is reading the stuff that it wasn't system stuff, it was setting stuff. And when when you're little and don't know much about history or whatever, I'm sure this works for older people to some degree too, um, reading a a detailed description of the the society of some made up place, the economics, the you know all this cultural stuff, um, its history, how all this stuff works together, and you know kind of the the overall cause and effect of civilization, um, and the proposition that if X, Y, and Z were different, all of these other things might be different falling logically from that. Like that, that kind of, of fluidity in your ability to, to understand the world and knowing that things are just this way, just because they were like this and that before. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it gave me a, a good sense of the context that I live in. And I, I think to this day, a lot of the, the way that I think about the world was, the tools that I look at the world with were formed early on there thinking about how politics works, how, you know, intrigue and greed and, you know, all these kinds of human motivations can play out in life. Um, I don't know. That was, uh, that was one of those things that I think was really valuable and and reading about religions and stuff, reading about all the different gods and shit Mm -hmm. in D and D and how each one of these things are presenting a, a different kind of philosophy or, you know, some, some facet or this and that school of thought, that stuff just opened my mind up. I mean, it just completely shattered any artificial walls that I had, and my imagination started going nuts after that. Oh my gosh, that means D&D is satanic. Yeah, hail <laughs> Satan. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, another real world example is that D&D gets everybody into Satanism. <laughs> I really regret that I didn't get more get into D and D at a younger age than what I did because I had every single hallmark of somebody who, when they were a um, late grade school, early junior high, I should have been a nerd. Well, I was a nerd. <laughs> I should have been a D and D nerd because I had every um, every measure that you could probably pick on. Uh, a kid that at that age, because I, I like to write stories. I had a really active imagination. Um, 
I, I read a, a ton of mythology. Um, I, I read books like, like somebody who really reads a lot of books <laughs> <laughs> and is good with words. <laughs> But (laughs) I do lament that I didn't get into it until I, my senior year of high school was the first time anybody even asked, even introduced me to the idea of the game. Um, And even then I didn't get to play because of extenuating circumstances until I got to my freshman year of college. Um, I really regret not having those experiences as a teenager um, learning all of the skills, Jordan, that you've, you've mentioned that you've, you picked up and that, uh, that D and D is good for developing because I feel like I could have, I could have developed into the person I am now sooner if I'd had that experience earlier. I wish, uh, I wish I was exposed to this stuff even earlier than I was I, as well. Um, I don't know. You, you are who you are because you know, X, Y, and Z was thus and such in the past. (laughs) I have no idea who I would be if I had never been introduced to role-playing games. I don't know if there was a pathway that would have happened that this wouldn't have happened. Like, there probably was, but the pushing it, it's just like, you're already in the nerd things. As you get older, you gotta find new nerd things. (laughs) And eventually, stumbling upon D&D or some form of it would have happened. Especially if you were into any sort of, like, board games as a kid. Like, even video games. Like, I still had pretty strong stigma against those types of things uh, in my upbringing. Um, Not, like, just nerd stuff in general. Mm -hmm. Um, The the place I'm from and kind of my parents' mindset. My parents are absolutely not nerds in any way, shape, or form. Any way, shape, or form. Um, I'm pretty sure Clayton was adopted. <laughs> Nobody's if, ever told him. <laughs> if I didn't look so goddamn much yeah, like my, you do. my you, you mom and dad, just like I would dad. swear I was from a different family. <laughs> Same. <laughs> my dad's the reason I'm the nerd I am today. He was into Star Trek and PC gaming and all of that garbage. <laughs> I, I am a full bred nerd. My mom is the only one that's not. <laughs> We tried to give our nephew a little bit of a chance to be a nerd, but it didn't work. When God, mm-hmm. I got him a book either last Christmas or two Christmases ago, and you should have seen the look on his face. <laughs> it's like, what is this crap? It was the dangerous book for boys. It was. Yeah. It was the dangerous book for boys. It was full of like all kinds of like survival stuff, survival stuff, like chemistry experiments, like really like how to like blow crap up. Like, shit, I'd buy that book. I know, seriously, <laughs> it was really cool. And he just, I don't think he's ever opened it, because it's a book. Uh, wow. How old is he? Um, like, nine, eight or nine. Something like that. Yikes. Give him till 12. He, yeah. he might crack a cover and be like, holy shit. <laughs> my brother never did, though. No? Yeah. My brother is not a nerd. Yeah. My sister thinks she's a nerd, but she's into, like, that Batman kind of nerddom, you know? Like that. Yeah. So she's pop a fake geek girl, girl, is what you're saying? Well, the pop culture level nerd yeah. of, like, I play Overwatch because my boyfriend does, and now I'm a gamer. I'm like, uh... the, the society at large has gotten significantly more geeky over the last yeah. couple decades. and because it's, it's gotten more techy. All the, yeah, yeah. And because the fucking nerds took over. <laughs> yes! I, I think I think that'll old school culture that I know you and I both came out of that, that like kind of backward rural, you know, anti-intellectual sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Like it's, yeah, it's completely shot itself in the foot and has made itself totally obsolete in the modern world. I mean, you know, had, had all of those people been encouraging people to get into technology and nerdy pursuits and, Mm -hmm. you know, intellectual things, People would be a lot better off in, you know, middle America and what have you, but yeah, uh, all these people were fantasizing about the coal jobs coming back or something, <laughs> yeah, and, you some know, of them still are. worrying about high school football is yeah. just completely useless for the world we live in now. 
And that's the, that's the thing that would have really um, changed what kind of person I was, I think, is if I had grown up when, like, being a nerd was kind of cool. Mm-hmm. That would have really changed me, I think. Yeah, I would have just been a normal kid. I wouldn't have been no, a right, kid exactly. who were afraid was going to shoot up the school. <laughs> yep. <laughs> No, I never so, had that, but I did have one uh, boss at a job tell me she was afraid if she fired me, I would come back and shoot everybody. <laughs> oh, my God. Can I you ha- imagine that? Me. I mean, seriously. Me. I, was, <laughs> I was told, after, like, like maybe a few weeks after Columbine that um, one, of, one of, like, I was in, that was my freshman year of college when Columbine happened. And a few weeks later, I was talking with a friend from high school, and she had said that if there was anybody who was going to do something like that at our school, she thought it would have been me. Wow. Yeah. After that happened, teachers got noticeably nicer and more concerned with how I was doing <laughs> in high school. Wow. Yeah. Nobody ever pulled me in and, you know, asked me if I was planning anything or anything yeah. crazy like that. But a lot of people started asking me, how are you doing? How's your grades? Blah, blah, blah. You yeah. know, that kind of shit. Like, never heard a word of it before that huh. but you know i think some people just don't trust quiet people yeah. i know. learned this like see. yeah i was a kid who's drawn like you know gory shit on my worksheets oh, and stuff well. like battle axes taking heads off and oh, shit yeah. like that and in art class i like drew we were supposed to draw something for halloween and so i drew like this evil looking centaur that had like bat wings and mm-hmm horns came out of its head and my mom had a talk with me when I brought it home because she thought it, I was worshipping Satan and my parents weren't even religious so where this came from I have no idea but yeah yeah we're all on the Satan slash mass murderer list apparently because I was growing up kids were just mean like if you weren't liking what they liked they were just like they just tormented you yeah it was less of like oh you're gonna you know, hurt people. It's more of like, a, oh, we're going to instead, you're weird and different. So like this locker and mm-hmm. have fun without your clothes after gym kind uh, of stuff. Yeah. yeah. That sucks. I got tormented all the time. I don't know how many times I'd be playing Magic the Gathering with my friends on the playground. My like two or three friends that would be caught dead in public playing Magic on the yeah. playground. And, you know, we're sitting there on a cement slab, you know, tapping our manor or whatever. And some fucking jock asshole comes by and just starts scooting his feet across oh, the magic gosh. card, scratching him up. <laughs> this makes me angry. Oh, motherfuckers. <laughs> See, I was, I was doing Yu-Gi-Oh! back then with, like, the two or three people that would play with me. We had, like, the whole dual disc thing and everything, and we just went at it. <laughs> I think my sister broke it, but it was a weird time. Assholes Why? will always be assholes. Nerds will evolve. <laughs> I had some weird people that were on my side, though, that really surprised me. Like, I remember this one girl that everybody was scared to death of because she regularly beat people up. Mm-hmm. And I, like, was changing after gym. And, like, I walked through, like, the second part of the girl's locker room. And she's, like, wailing on some girl. And I'm, like, trying to sneak past. And she looks up and she goes, oh, hi, Beth. And I'm, like, <laughs> goes back to beating this girl up. I'm, like, hi. <laughs> Maybe just because she could tell... I was really different and wasn't really making it either. I don't know, but You'd be like, yeah, kick her ass. <laughs> <laughs> well, guys, <laughs> what do you say we stop this bullshit because we've really gone into some bullshit and start rolling some dice. <laughs> This has been a production of Alien Familiar Media. You can find past episodes and more at alienfamiliar.com. You can email us at alienfamiliarmedia at gmail.com. This production is protected under a Creative Commons non-commercial attribution no derivatives license. Music for this episode is Suburban Outlaw by Forget the Whale and can be found at freemusicarchive.org.